Let's go to Washington and get some analysis from Daniel Isinger, who's a research fellow at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, welcome to the program, Daniel. First of all, is there any doubt that Wagner Russian mercenaries are in Mali? Has the junta actually admitted it publicly? Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, no, I don't believe that the, the junta has admitted it publicly. They continue to contend that uh, there are uh, Russian trainers alongside their armed forces participating in the field. Um, but there's not been any official recognition. But this is part of the, the Wagner Group uh, ethos. Uh, they operate in sort of a nebulous and difficult to assess uh, type of environment. Uh, it's a conglomerate of different shadowy logistics and mercenary groups all under uh, this famous heading or infamous heading of Wagner Group. Um, and so it, it, it's not likely we're ever going to have any kind of official uh, confirmation of their of their activity, even though it's becoming more and more documented that uh, there are Russian uh, mercenaries in Mali uh, that are engaged in conflict, uh, uh, fighting alongside Malian soldiers. Is it possible to understand the fallout between Paris and Bamako from the Malian point of view? I mean, the military-dominated government, the junta, has quite a bit of support amongst people who have suffered years and years of violence, and they say that when the French soldiers came to Mali, that they only had one aim, and that was a military aim, that they had no interest in terms of helping people and the development of the areas where they live. Well, I, I think that uh, one way to assess uh, the junta in terms of uh, how, to, how seriously to take its claims is to, by looking at its track record. Uh, the, the Malian military junta justified its seizure of power by claiming it was uniquely able to provide security, uh, enhance justice, and, and it also claimed that it would return the country over to democratic civilian rule uh, within a, an 18-month timeline that it would agree to with its uh, West African neighbors. Um, but if you look at, at these claims, it, it hasn't made progress on any of them. In fact, it's moved backwards. Uh, and its actions suggest that it's more interested in maintaining power and entrenching military rule. Um, since August 2020, when the initial coup uh, put the junta in power, uh, extremist violence has been higher every single quarter uh, following August 2020. Um, it's also been deadlier for civilians, uh, and that's just in, in instances of violence against civilians that involved uh, militant Islamist groups or jihadist groups operating in the area. That's not taking into account the alleged human rights abuses or atrocities that have happened at the hands of the armed forces itself. Um, it's also ignored that 18-month transition timeline and indicated that it's looking to remain in power for another five years. Uh, it's, it's faced dissent in its efforts to hang on to power, and it's handled that by arresting and, uh, and repressing opposition, which has had a chilling effect on civil society uh, and other members of, of Malian pl uh, political class. Now, all of this suggests that the, that the junta's actions are really about rehabilitating an image of military government. Uh, with an aim of re uh, returning Mali to extended authoritarian rule, uh, and, and not really in the interests of Malian society or Malian citizens. How can international forces, I mean, the French say that they're not going to abandon the region, despite this slow withdrawal from Mali itself. How can international forces continue the fight against uh, terrorism across the Sahel? Well, uh, I know that recently the Nigerian, uh, that's uh, Mali's neighbor to the, to the east, uh, Niger, uh, their parliament voted to uh, establish agreements with different international forces so that they could conduct an, uh, engaged military interventions. Um, and so there'll be some uh, effort to think through strategy of, of containing the crisis in the Sahel from a different location. Um, but the bigger issue here, I think, still has to do with Mali. Um, what we're seeing play out is a, a large-scale effort at a disinformation campaign, and this is consistent with the Wagner Group's efforts across the African continent. Um, they've really had success in reaching a large African audience online with very little overhead, and these, com these campaigns are, are terribly damaging to d diplomacy um, as well as just uh, the, the, the populism that it provides uh, to these the actors like the military junta. Um, and, and this can be, th this just fosters greater uh, anti-democratic, uh, anti-West uh, sentiment within the population. And it's part of a ambiguous warfare strategy, which is, is straight out of Russian military doctrine. 
Uh, it relies on strategies that amplify grievances, exploit divisions within society. They foster fragmentation and inaction, a sort of voter apathy objective. Um, and and this, the, often the objective is simply to confuse citizens uh, by creating false equivalencies, uh, making it difficult to decipher facts from fiction. Um, and all of this has a deteriorating effect on social trust, critical theory, uh, critical thinking, um, citizens' ability to engage in politics fairly, essentially the lifeblood of a functioning democracy. And I, I think that's what we're seeing play out in Mali today. I think the Mali, the Mali uh, junta is hand in glove with the, the Wagner group in trying to uh, pursue these strategies, and that complicates the situation. So um, I think the international community needs to, to be aware of what's possibly going on there and think of ways to counter it and hold, hold those uh, responsible accountable for it. Daniel Eisinger, thank you very much indeed, Daniel. Thank you.